I just want to verify my presumption. How many people here know closure? How many people don't know closure? Okay. So, one of the great things about closure, as it is in hiring, it's also with audiences a great way to sort of filter out the, the best of the best. <laughs> so, I uh, appreciate your coming. Um, so, what I'm going to do is uh, talk about. Uh, how we implemented Datomic and Clojure. Um, and I'll start by describing Datomic itself and the overall architecture, and then dig into a few of the implementation details and sort of summarize. Uh, what I'd like to do is go relatively quickly and have some question and answer, but that may be too ambitious because I do have almost 40 slides, which usually takes me two hours. So uh, why don't we get started? Uh, so uh, I guess the other question is, how many people are familiar with Datomic at all? A little bit, okay. Uh, so we'll go through uh, what Datomic is about. Uh, fundamentally, Datomic's a, uh, a database. And uh, the overarching goal is to uh, move away from a monolithic, monolithic notion of what constitutes a database to one where the facilities of a database are distributed, and in particular, substantial portions of the power normally attributed to the server in a database are moved into your application servers themselves. So you get more, ability, you know, more power over programming with data inside your application logic because typically that's been over there uh, and outside of your, your, the scope of your program itself. Um, a couple of sort of architectural changes with a, a data model. Uh, it might seem familiar if you were at the keynote yesterday. Uh, because it, it really strives to, uh, to achieve the objectives uh, that I discussed about modeling information itself and incorporating time. And it's been enabled by the fact that computers have gotten faster and networks have gotten faster. And many of the old uh, architectural presumptions about data locality, in particular about the advantages of uh, a particular machine having the data on its disk, are gone now due to the way networks work. Um, there, are, there are not advantages for that machine. So, so why do this? I think for these two reasons, right? We want to pursue this different architecture. What happens when we deconstruct the database? And uh, I, you know, I want a different data model. So architecturally, we can look at you know, databases of moving through this spectrum. Uh, we start with traditional client server. This was born of the fact that you know, way back, um, computers were really expensive. They, were, they didn't have very much capacity and getting a a single one big machine was a big expense, and so uh, that machine became very special. Uh, you could only afford one, and you put all the good stuff there, and, and the clients were pretty lightweight. Uh, but this design fundamentally has a bunch of capabilities that we want to track as we move from architecture to architecture. Right? A traditional database has query support. It supports transactions. Um, it ensures consistency of the information uh, that's placed into it. And usually, traditionally, that server also was in charge of storage. Uh, moving forward from this, uh, we can look at, well, OK, maybe in an effort to get more throughput or some scalability, we would cluster the server. Again, we still have sort of a single logical entity. We're using more than one machine to accomplish it, but it still acts as a single entity uh, handling, um, handling the same jobs and sort of acting as one unit. And this is very difficult to do, and as you know, probably usually expensive to do. And uh, a second, and of course, there's still real big challenges there because the amount of coordination between clustered uh, servers is very high. So in an effort to get even more scale, uh, we've taken those servers and divided them up and said, let's shard the data. And at the point you shard the data, um, you, you really end up with independent databases. You know, you can, maybe the sharding is done sort of globally, but really your information is no longer connected. This is three different databases. Uh, and uh, so you start, to, you start to lose, right? You start sharding and then you can't query against shards. You can't do transactions across shards. You can't ensure consistency across shards. And really, that's why I think you should consider these independent. Um, but you still have uh, maybe storage subsystems. Uh, that are being that are being serviced, but um, sharded servers really have fewer capabilities. Uh, and then we move to sort of the newer generation of things that say, well, you know what, 
By the time you're sharding, you're not really getting many of those advantages. Let's just have key value stores. Now we have true independence. We're just going to you know, consistent hash your keys and then go find the machine that they're going to run on. And now we have independence here. Uh, and at this point, I, I think uh, you completely lose everything, right? You no longer have queries of any, you know, certainly not ad hoc queries. There's no transactionality left. There's no consistency left. Everything is atomic and independent. So the idea of multiple things being related to each other is gone. You're really just in a storage system. And I think you should basically start labeling th these things distributed storage services, because they're not at all like databases anymore. Databases really had a lot of leverage, was one of the words I used yesterday. Databases give you leverage. Right? There's no leverage in a key value store. Leverage is gone. This is like a glorified file system. I put this blob there. I called it 1234. And if I ask for 1234, I get the blob back. Uh, it's not a database, no leverage. But there are lots of um, interesting architectural advantages to this, in particular for scale and for read scale. So we want to tap into that. So the Atomic starts with, with that idea of a distributed storage service and says there's a lot of value to that proposition. Um, but let's try to re-obtain uh, the leverage we had from traditional databases. And the first thing we want to do is reinstall queries. Uh, so obviously, if we use a storage service, we have storage. And what we're going to do with queries is we're going to place them in the application servers. So now every application server gets its own brain. Um, but we still don't have transactions or consistency at this point. But you'll see, if we move from the key value store, you know, everybody, every participant, every client of a key value store could write to the key value store and read from it. We're going to change that. We're going to say, you can only read from the storage service. And we're going to uh, re uh, install a privileged member here, which we call the transactor, whose job is strictly to coordinate transactions and consistency. And by reintroducing this element, we end up with a hybrid model with some interesting properties, right? We have distributed reads, we have distributed storage, we have redundancy in storage, um, but we get back transactions and consistency. So this is a hybrid model that has uh, a sort of a traditional model for writes and a new model for reads. Uh, and this transactor only deals with uh, writes. It doesn't handle any read load at all. It doesn't answer queries or anything like that. So when an application has some novelty, right, new facts, it's going to send it to the transactor. The transactor is going to broadcast this back to the other uh, peers, we call them, that are connected and also commit it to storage. So it's transactional, it's durable, it won't return until it's in storage. And at that point, it gets reflected back. But you also have this nice path of um, novelty being distributed by this, by this system. And at this point, we have um, everything back. So one way to look at this is to sort of take, take the pieces of the traditional architecture and see where they end up in this model. So if we look at a traditional database, again, we have this monolithic thing. It does indexing. It does transactions. It does I.O. to storage. It handles query load. Um, your application itself uh, is very, you know, it doesn't have much power at all. It's completely relying on the server to do all the thinking. Uh, but, it, but it often has, you know, like a caching layer or something like that because this unit gets overloaded. So what happens is applications will go, you know, issue queries and then say, wow, that was expensive. Maybe somebody else will ask the same question. I will manually go and put that answer in a cache. And then, then I'll manually check the cache before I do this. And this is all sort of on me to add this layer to try to avoid overloading the centralized resource. So we can look at where all these components end up. IO moves to a storage service um, and uh, is handled completely by that. And that's isolated. Uh, transactions move into the transactor, which only does that. Uh, indexing is currently a background process inside the transactor. Um, that could move out of there, but that happens to be where it's done right now. And then the application process itself, and you, you can read this as an app server, right? That, that tier that was your app server, now has a query component inside it, which is embedded, uh, as well as this propagated index. So it's got a live index and the ability to read from storage. <coughs> And by reading from storage as needed and live merging with this index, it can provide the application with very, very fast local query capability that's isolated from the rest of the system. 
And so we can go and dig into what attributes we're trying to achieve by breaking it apart like this. So the first thing we want to do is we really want to uh, accept the fact that um, as we move forward with more virtualization, we have virtualized memory, now we have virtualized storage, and now we sort of virtualized uh, architecture. You know, we have machines, we can, you know, machines that we can start and then they go away. We have storage, um, we have all this ephemeral, all these ephemeral components. So you want to design systems, you know, moving forward for components that you, every component is ephemeral. Everything can die, you know, failure is a continuous state. So you want to design for that. You want to design for unreliable disks. And that's part of what's happening here. You need redundancy as soon as you do that. right? You can't have a privileged machine with a privileged disk. Um, so you want redundancy in the storage. And you want to, well, we want to be able to piggyback on top of existing reliable storage services. So DynamoDB would be an example of an existing reliable storage service. Right? There's no reason why you know, every database needs to solve every problem associated with databases. You're just going to get a million implementations of how to put blocks on the disk and how to read them back. And there's really no advantage to doing that anymore. And there's substantial advantage, as you'll see, in uh, making this an independent uh, architectural component. In particular, you can have more than one storage service. So we support memory. We support um, SQL, we support InfiniSpan, um, and there's a bunch of other interesting key value stores like Couchbase or Reoc that make logical sense in this role as a storage service. So combining these things makes a lot of sense. Let each component do what it does best. Uh, the other thing we're looking for is scale, right? So I think one of the problems we've had in deconstructing architectures so far is that we've taken everything together and said, this is monolithic database. Let's make a bunch of monolithic databases. And that's how we get distribution. But now we're taking everything, right? Storage, query, um, transactionality, or the lack thereof, and saying, let's divide that up and have a bunch of little pie pieces that all look the same. Um, as you saw in the prior diagram, um, I don't think you actually want to do that. I think you want to make independent decisions about transactionality, storage, and query. When you do that, you get independent scaling characteristics and independent failover characteristics for each part of the architecture. So um, in the case of query, because we've put query capability in each uh, application server, when you add more application servers, you get more query power transparently. Um, and that's truly elastic. When you need less uh, query power, you just stop some of those machines from running, and it goes, it goes down. It's easy also for this kind of scaling to tap into demand-driven scaling, right? So when you set up auto-scaling um, in, in, uh, in Amazon, for instance, right, you can, you can make that triggered by the amount of demand and the amount of load that's being seen. Contrast that kind of, and you're getting query scaling out of this. Contrast that with saying, you know, I'm going to pre-configure a cluster, or I'm going to manually go to a console and add a machine to a cluster so that I can have more, you know, a bigger clustered server. That's a very explicit action. It's not responding to demand dynamically. Uh, so it's a big deal to tap into demand-driven scaling capabilities. And that's what's happening now with, with, re, uh, with uh, query when you embed it in the application tier. So you get your own brain. Uh, we're going to look in more detail at what, what these pieces are from an implementation detail. But you have query, communication engine, you have memory and a caching engine all built into your application servers by including the peer, peer library. And the, what the effect of that to your application is the database feels like a local resource. And this is a very big deal because uh, I, I don't think people really appreciate how much, how, how much client server has invaded the way they think about um, what applications can do and, and, um, and what's OK. Right? Because the, the, this conversational aspect and the, and the fact that you think it's expensive and, think that you, the, and you think that you're tapping into a shared resource that's potentially getting overloaded really compromises what you think, uh, what your application is allowed to do. And uh, when you move this stuff local, now it's completely different, right? If you want to run, if you have your own app server and it's doing analytics and it needs to run queries that run a long time, is that okay? Now all of a sudden it's completely okay. Those queries don't tie up any shared resources. No one's waiting for you. It's your own machine. Uh, that's a complete inversion of logic from when you have a, a server or even a set of servers that's a shared resource that you really count on. So ad hoc queries, long running queries, that all becomes okay because you have your own brains. Um, from a logic side, again, part of, you know, one, of the, one of the mission statements was to bring 
uh, the power of programming with data into the application. That's what we're trying to do. So we have a declarative logic engine built into the application uh, peers. Uh, it uses data log. This is, uh, how many people know what data log is? Not too many. So it's a, it's a, it's a query language. It's kind of pattern oriented. Um, it's very simple uh, in, in, a, in a true notion of simplicity. And, um, but it has power equivalent to relational algebra. So it's the full power of relational algebra. Uh, but the point is now that that's in your application. So this is a really great thing. I mean, SQL is a really great thing. It's set oriented, it's declarative, it's very powerful, but it's always been over there. You know, in the server, in a different language, I have to send strings to it, I get something back, it's conversational. Um, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot about that that doesn't make it useful to you in your application. It would be nice if you could use it in your application. And that's, that's what we've done. So you have data log locally. Um, in data log itself, joins are implicit, right? It's very evident kind of code as you read it. And uh, in, in addition to being able to access the database, we really want applications to be more declarative themselves. So the data log engine can be applied to your own uh, data in memory or data from other sources. So you can combine uh, database uh, sources and in memory sources and collections together in queries. You can query non, you can query collections. You can query, you know, system get, uh, what is it called? Get environment, no, properties. properties. System get properties, right? You can query that. You can query the result of that instead of having to write this loop. Um, and I think that's really important, right? Because those kinds of applications are, are, are clearer and easier to, to debug and make correct. Um, so perception is also important. It's the thing I talked about uh, yesterday. Perception in the real world is, a, is, a, is facilitated by passive communication. You don't ask things to see them, right? Light, light bounces off them, and you just observe it because it comes to you. It bounces off them and comes to you, and you didn't do anything, and they didn't do anything. And uh, mimicking that architecturally means push, essentially, right? It means some sort of broadcast. And so um, you can get a queue of transactions inside a peer. It will include your own transactions as well as the transactions of others. And then you can hook into that for any purpose you want. So you can make reactive systems that don't have to pull the database. Again, you're trying to sort of get away from this. There is this central thing I need to go and keep uh, asking questions of. From a consistency standpoint, we, because we've re-established uh, a, a significant component in the um, transactor, we get back ACID transactions with full ACID capabilities, including the ability to be consistent across any piece of data inside the system at all. So there's no sharding and there's no um, separation there. There's no per document transactions or per document set or anything like that. Um, the other thing, the other notion, so that's the, that's the traditional notion of consistency that has to do with process, right, change. I want, I want a set of changes to be done all together or not at all. Um, and isolated, right, those properties. But I think there's another notion of consistency which really matters to application logic, which is, can I present to my application logic a consistent set of data so that I can run a, run a report, right? How many people have, are able to make reproducible reports against an in-place update database? It's very difficult, right, because the database changes between when you made the report and not, and then you have to do all this extra work, and sometimes it's just simply impossible. What happens uh, inside Datomic and what we're trying to achieve, and it's part of what's interesting about the implementation from a closure perspective, is we're actually trying to present the entire database to the application as a value, as a first class value like I talked about, like completely immutable, you don't see any, any other changes, um, every, every part about it is evident, it's comparable, and all those other kinds of uh, characteristics. And so the way we achieve that is to make sure that all the data that's kept in the storage service is immutable. Uh, we want the database to be programmable. Obviously, as Clojure users, we care a lot about programmability of programs. And uh, it's a traditional sore spot for databases that they're not particularly programmable. Uh, so you'll see as we go through this that transactions and rules and queries, they're all data. They're data in, they're data out. They're defined in terms of data, not in terms of operations. Um, and there's a bunch of you know, common sense things in terms of extensibility and predicates. And also, critically, uh, queries can invoke your own code, so it's an extensible system in terms of the logic that can run. Unsurprisingly, uh, the model from a data model perspective is that it's a database of facts. 
And uh, when you try to follow through some of the things I talked about yesterday all the way down, um, you realize that um, it's very difficult to make an efficient database of facts if the granularity of a fact is, is a row or a document. Right? They're too big. If you're going to say, I want to record change, um, unless you have an independent delta scheme, um, you really you, know, you have to say, you know, I got a new address. Right? Let me save you again. That doesn't make sense. Uh, you need something that can represent just you know, new, new email address. And so that means boiling down to uh, sort of an atomic notion of what constitutes uh, a fact. And um, you can easily build up the requirements for this, right? Uh, Sally is not a fact. Sally likes is not a fact. Sally likes pizza is also not yet a fact. Because what did we learn about facts yesterday? Yeah, facts are things that happen. So Sally likes pizza, you know, as of when? When did that, when did that happen? Um, that now is a fact. And uh, rather than store uh, like a time of day component here, what we do is we store the transaction that recorded the fact, because then we can put the time of day on the transaction, but we can also put other interesting and useful stuff on the transaction, like who did it, what was the source of the data, you know, has it been approved, and other things like that. Um, and you know, only, only uh, incur the expense of one additional component to this thing. So we call this thing a datum, entity, attribute, value, and transaction. And uh, the only schema that's associated with, uh, with a datomic database is the definition of attributes. Right? There's no other structural construct. There's no records, there's no um, types, there's no classes, there's no document schemas or anything like that. Um, but you do need to define attributes before you use them. Um, they have a name, they have a type, they have a cardinality, um, they have whether or not it's a component of the thing that points to it, and a few other things. Is that a static thing that you define before you actually use it, or is it a runtime, I want a new attribute of this? You can make a new attribute, and uh, attributes are data. Attributes are facts, right? They're stored in the database just like and right alongside everything else. Completely queryable and um, time-coordinated everything. They're just data. Um, they're just facts. I mean, every element has a time. Every fact has a transaction it occurred in, and transactions have time associated with so them. Most also have an expiration time, so when you don't like pizza any, any longer. No, there's a new fact, which is you no longer like pizza. And that fact happened at a different time. And that's how we do it. So there are assertions and retractions. We don't go back to facts and change them, right? We, there's just a new fact. I moved. So that, that does mean my address is no longer this, but just saying I have a new address is sufficient to say that, imply that it's not the old address. And cardinality can help make that automatic, too. Right? If you have a cardinality one thing, and you now have a new value of it, it means the last value has been superseded. Um, OK. Uh, like many of the, the newer databases, uh, we, we do want to try to address some of the pressures that have been faced by people trying to use rectangle-oriented you know, rectangle databases, you know, traditional Relational databases force uh, rigid schemas that you know can't have blanks and uh, have difficulty dealing with multi-value uh, entities and uh, hierarchical data and sparse data. Um, and of course, the beautiful thing about a uh, about a model like this that's atomic is you can build any of those things that you want, but you're not forced into them. And Stu's talk later is going to have a great examples of all of that. Um, that talk is not the next talk; it's the talk in the Iconoclasts track. But the next uh, talk will be really good too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we we're, we want to we want to move away from structural rigidity as as you know most people most people do. And uh, of course we saw in order to be a fact based database we have to have time built in. We saw every datum has its own transaction, right? The transactions are totally ordered. Um, they're first class, and uh, because the database is a value and because everything has time on it, you can actually say of the database itself, give me this database as of last week or since two months ago, and then issue queries against that view of things. Uh, but the focus of this talk is on implementation, so let's look at the architecture a little bit, uh, a little bit more close up. This is just the components of Datomic now. We're going to see the application process uses a peer library, has some communications components, has something that represents the index, has a caching component and query component. The transactor has indexing and transactions and storage. 
Um, the things we're trying to accomplish with this design are right, uh, the problems we're trying to solve right, in the design. The first thing we have to do is deal with uh, state. Right? How is the database a value? In other words, how can you think of something that is getting new facts as a value? Um, and one way to conceive of it is sort of like a, you know, the rings of a tree. Right? As you add new rings to the outside of a tree, the inner parts don't change. And so with that kind of a notion of value, in other words, it's immutable, but it's, it expands over time. Um, you're still not updating in place. So you still actually have all the value benefits, uh, as long as you're able to talk about it as a particular point in time. So that's sort of a philosophical hurdle you have to get around. Uh, but at that point, you're fine. Uh, but again, the key here is leverage. Right? The point of a database is to organize information so that you can get leverage out of it. And in my mind, leverage is query, right? and its organization is indexes. Um, so the way we do this is we have state is represented as a sorted set of facts. Um, but one of the things that's really important is to learn the lessons of uh, big table. Right? And what big table showed us was maintaining sort and maintaining an index live on disk is a bad idea. It's incredibly inefficient. You keep rewriting the head of something. And what you want to do instead is accumulate change, right? And then and merge it periodically. Does everybody know how big table works? Everybody know how big table works? Yeah, so big table accumulates a bunch of stuff. It keeps a sorted set in memory and a sorted set on disk. Right? And then every now and then, it will merge from memory to disk. When you ask it a question, it always answers the question by giving you a live merge of memory plus disk. So it's the same strategy here. Right? That's very, very important. I don't think you can do an efficient, live indexed, immutable thing. Um, you just use way too much storage. And you're constantly you know, garbage collecting. Um, so we do an occasional merge into storage. Now, that doesn't mean that the data is not durable. Right? We keep everything that comes in as of the transaction um, acknowledgement has been made durable. But it's not necessarily been merged into the, the durable index. Um, and until it has been, it's kept in memory. Uh, and unsurprisingly for Clojure users, right, the whole thing behind this is persistent trees. So now we have durable persistent trees. So we can look at um, what the memory component of this looks like. Right? It's, a, it's a persistent sorted set. It is not the one that is in Clojure, um, which is a red-black tree. This is a new persistent sorted set um, that uses big internal nodes. So it works a lot more like some of the other, um, the other Clojure data structures. And it has pluggable comparators you know, that you would expect. And there's always two of these maintained. So without any user intervention, we're always maintaining all of the datums in entity attribute value time sort and attribute entity value time sort. And then there are ways to get or request attribute value sorts and the reverse indexing. Right? We do reverse indexing automatically for any entity to entity references. So if Sally likes um, Fred, um, there's a fast way to get from Fred to the fact that Sally likes Fred. Uh, so we can look a little bit about what we do in storage itself. Um, unsurprisingly, we use storage like a tree, right? Unlike Bigtable, which takes the segments that it produces in memory and, and does a full merge sort into another big block on the disk. Uh, we're not that disk centric. We're anticipating using more key value store like storage engines. So we want to keep the block orientation that's traditional in databases. So we use storage as this akin to the way a traditional database uses the file system. We store blocks in storage. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, asserts and retractions. That's all the fundamental data boils down to asserts and retractions stored in these sorted indexes. Um, what we require of a storage engine um, is most basically key value storage. Right? We're going to associate a key not with some particular fact. We don't use these values are actually big chunks. They're like segments. They're like blocks of a traditional database. We put blocks of datomic data, sorted datomic data into storage. Um, but um, interestingly, uh, doing this full implementation requires the closure data model, right? the closure state model. We have essentially a distributed version of the closure state model um, with the moral equivalence of atoms and refs. And that puts the requirement of the um, on the storage system that they offer consistent read so we can implement atoms and conditional put or CAS or something like it so we can support pods or you can 
I hate to say pods, but yeah, pods are like accumulator-like refs. Um, so it's a closure state model now extended to storage. And storage looks like this. Uh, essentially, there's a single root of the index. Okay, there's additional storage associated with the log. So as data comes in, it's immediately put in in the log. This is the thing that's periodically updated. Um, and again, it's not updated in place. Everything we put in here is immutable. Uh, but there's a root that points to a bunch of the different sorts. We also do Lucene inside this. Um, and it's associated with a, uh, an in, uh, transaction time. In other words, this includes all transactions prior to this one. And uh, unsurprisingly, it's a tree. Um, it's a very, very high branching factor tree, and it's very shallow. So it's only three levels no matter what. Okay, there's a root, which is a bunch of pointers to directories, which are a bunch of pointers to segments. Each segment is a bunch of sorted datums, sorted compressed datums. Um, and it's these things that we actually store key value like into storage. So a whole big block, like 64K of sorted datums go in at a time into storage. And that's, that's how that looks. And then we can lift up a level to what a database value is. So we said the application has a database value. Right? So we know what like a, a map is in Clojure because it's, like, it's all in memory. Right? So how do we do a value like that to present it to the application that's actually backed essentially partially by storage and has I.O. associated with getting that storage. And that looks like this. There's a, there's a root, which is the, the, the DB value object, which is stored in an atom. <laughs> this is it. This is all the closure state stuff that I need to implement uh, a database enclosure. That's all. There's not a, like a pile of stuff. One atom is wrapped around the database. It's got a pointer to that memory index. So this memory index is that persistent sorted set, a set of persistent sorted sets. And it's got a pointer to um, a hierarchical cache that's backed with, uh, you know, on cache miss with I.O. to the storage system. And that's, again, in parallel. So there's going to be EABT up here, EABT down here, AABT, AABT, and everything else. So this, the new, the novelty is accumulating memory, and the, everything that happened before is accumulating here. So periodically, we'll flush the novelty, and it will be here. And this will empty out. Um, and all of this is immutable. This is immutable, that's immutable, this is immutable. This is the only immutable thing, right? This atom. We're going to swap it occasionally to, to new stuff. So you have this mirrored set of, of things, a memory version and a, and a disk version. Uh, and the disk is ultimately backed by storage. Uh, I'll describe a little bit how we use Guava for that. So that's sort of the storage side. The other part of the system is the process side, right? How do we send change across? And uh, a fundamentally, process is done with assertions and retractions. But assertions and retractions are insufficient to do transformation, right? If I want to say, I want to add $10 to your account balance, if I just assert, you know, if your balance was 1,000 and I said 1,010, um, that's potentially a, a, a race condition with somebody else who's trying to adjust your balance. So you really want to have a functional transformation of, of values in the database. And the way we do that is with transaction functions. A transaction function is a function of the value of the database and some arguments. And what it produces is other, whoops, it produces other transaction data. Right? So if a transaction is assertions and retractions and maybe calls to transaction functions, then a transaction function can return assertions, retractions, and maybe calls to other transaction functions. Right? So that's what it looks like, a set of these things. And what happens is, um, transaction functions get called and their results get spliced into the transaction. So if I said assert, assert, retract, call foo on something, you know, or let's just read this as adjust account balance for Fred, retract, assert, assert, and then this turned into a two-step process that was, you know, do this and then do that, and those eventually expand. Eventually it's going to bottom out on all assertions and retractions. And for closure users, what does this smell like? Macro expansion, right? It's, it's just like macro expansion. But it's a beautiful thing for a data model because it really makes sense. Um, there's ground for data, which is assertions and retractions, and functional transformations either expand into other transformations or eventually it all returns to ground. And it's, it's only 
this set of final assertions and retractions that ends up in the database and that gets broadcast out to the peers. So the transactor accepts transactions. It serializes transactions. Right? There's research done at Yale that proved it's much faster to just serialize transactions and do it all in memory than it is to have a complicated scheme for trying to figure out who's overlapping with who and how queries and, and, and uh, transactions uh, interact with each other. Um, it's actually the same research that is behind Volt, uh, which takes a similar approach, but Volt still combines reads and writes where we only use this for writes. Um, so we accept transactions. Transactions need to be expanded, right, in the process I just described. They have to be applied. Um, that may or may not succeed. That's all done truly functionally inside the transactor, right? So if the transactor has any problems doing any of that job, the prior value is untouched. It's unaffected. It was done as a functional transformation. There's no undoing and no complicated rollback. Um, uh, at the point it's got an acceptable transaction, it needs to log it. Um, at that point, the tra transaction happened, right? So it's been made durable. And it will then broadcast the change to everybody who's uh, connected and obviously to the person who issued the transaction so they know it succeeded. Uh, the other thing the transactor does is index in the background. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And uh, the indexing itself creates garbage. Right? I said there will be garbage in, in the slide yesterday. So using storage immutably um, and using it to represent persistent data structures creates garbage. But the beautiful thing about this garbage is it's not interleaved in the middle of another file. Right? What happens when we make a new index is some nodes of the other tree are now no longer referenced from the new tree. So we just say, we don't care about them. We delete them wholesale. There's no merging. There's no recreating a whole big master thing again. And some of the big, long rewrites you know, associated with uh, things like Cassandra, for instance, they go away because we're not taking the big table approach to merging. Um, inside the transactor implementation, we use a bunch of uh, interop stuff. So we use Hornet queue to do the communications for transaction communication. The internal structure of the transactor is highly pipelined. So again, I talked about sort of programming with data and the ability to use queues to pipeline your architecture internally. That's what happens inside uh, the transactor implementation. There's a lot of pipelining. So even though we're, so what's interesting is you say, ooh, you, couldn't you make the transactor faster if you did uh, transactions in parallel? The answer is no, but it doesn't mean you want to have your transactor use only one core of the transactor machine. So how do you get back leverage from having the cores? You pipeline your architecture. You say, okay, there'll be a thread that's just expanding transactions, a thread that's applying transactions, a thread that's taking applied transactions and uh, compressing them, and then a thread that's doing the I.O. and a thread that's doing the, um, the acknowledgment. Now you're using all the cores in your box efficiently, but you're still doing a, what's effectively a serial process with just a lot of pipelining inside it. And all that stuff's done asynchronously like that. And then, of course, the other nice thing about being Clojure is you know, all of the storage APIs we want to use, um, all the storage engines we want to use have Java APIs, so we just use them. Uh, indexing itself. Uh, has, does extensive use of laziness. So the indexing job has got to walk through the tree um, in memory and find the nodes in the tree that's in storage that need to be replaced because they have data merged into them. And um, that process is done in parallel. It uses PMAP because it's dealing with a data set that's bigger than what fits in memory, but we want to have parallelism. Also, it does a lot of parallel I.O. to the storage engines because we expect storage engines like DynamoDB to be highly parallelized. So we don't want to have a serial approach to interacting with the storage engine. So again, a ton of parallelism in the indexing job. But it all uses ordinary closure stuff. Um, the one interesting point here is, you know, I told you the database was a single atom. So if you think about the fact that um, the indexing job is to, it, its role is to take what's in memory, merge it into disk. The, the result of that operation should be you don't need to have it in memory anymore. But while the indexing job was going on, you know, more transactions came through. So you're going to have this point in time where you're finished indexing. You may have accumulated some more novelty. But you need to now say, of that novelty, I only care about the stuff that happened since I started the indexing job. Um, rather than have a, um, a contention issue coming back from indexing, we just put the indexing results into the input queue because it's being serially um, processed. And then so you're going to process transactions, see the result of an indexing job, do the what we call the acceptance of that, which will nuke the fact that you don't care about 
uh, this memory index and not have any contention. So we can still do it with one atom. Uh, so I mean, I think the critical thing for closure people is, you know, closure has these state constructs. Um, they're, it's really great that they have really good semantics. You know, they're meant to be used sparingly, and, and this shows you how little bit, tiny little bit of it you need for a, a very large system. Uh, uh, on the on the uh, peer side, right? One of the things we said is we're going to have declarative programming, so we have an embedded data log. It's a new language, essentially, um, that that I had to write, which is beautiful and fun to write in Clojure. Uh, it takes data and, uh, and sources and rule sets as arguments. So um, if you're used to, say, Cascalog, it sort of has an ambient notion. It uses, um, uses actually, you know, in being embedded in Clojure and name resolution in Clojure to sort of figure out what the, uh, what the data sources are. This is callable from Java, so everything is explicit. You know, if you have a data source you want to operate on, you pass it. If you have a rule set you want to use in the data log query, you're going to pass it. Um, and it's been extended to work with um, your own collections, and it calls your own code. Inside the implementation, uh, it's all data-driven, right? So queries are data, uh, rule sets are data, uh, query results are data, transactions are data. And by that I mean Java util collections, Java util list, Java util map. Now obviously closure collections are those things, so using this from closure is a breeze. But Java people can also program against this without using strings. They can write programs that write queries and, and so forth because the interface is actually defined in terms of data structures. So that should be familiar. Um, the implementation, if you know anything about data log, there are sort of two fundamental ways to go about doing data log implementation. One is query subquery recursive, and uh, the other one is blanking on me now, magic sets. Um, Query sub query recursive is actually a great fit for closure. Um, uh, and in particular because it's dynamic. But the big advantage, so how many people know about core logic in closure? The big advantage over something like core logic or prolog is the semantics of those things are um, result at a time or tuple at a time. The semantics of, uh, of data log are set at a time. That means that underneath the hood, inside queries that run here, entire sets are being merge joins. And the things that you expect of a query engine, like um, a hash join, a true hash join, right? So I have M and N. Instead of doing M times N lookups, I'm going to go and take N, put it into a hash table on whatever the join characteristic is, and now I have M plus N complexity. That kind of thing, which you never write yourself by hand in your applications, um, you want from a database engine, and it's possible in data log. Uh, but not in the semantics of Prolog. So it does that and therefore is really fast. Um, it leverages the indexes when one of the components is, a, is the database itself. And uh, when it encounters expressions, you can embed expressions in queries. It uses the closure compiler. It calls you know, eval, not for, um, not for interpretation uh, reasons, but in order, it evals a function definition once and then caches the results so it can make a true function call you know, every iteration. So it's not interpreting, but it does use the closure compiler at runtime. And we cache all the transformation stages. So I talked about the difference between over here and over there with a, with a, with a server. Um, we have in the peers direct access to the storage server, so we're actually going to embed in the peers the library for communicating with you know, Dynamo or SQL or whatever your back end is. They have this query engine. Um, they have that database I described, right? The combination of a live index and a and a, and a uh, storage-backed index being live merged. That happens in the transactor for transaction support. It happens in the peers for query support. The exact same thing. The exact same components are present in the peer to represent the database. Peers also have a, a caching scheme built in. Obviously, the data set could be huge, right? It could be arbitrarily large, but all any particular application server cares about is its working set. So it doesn't have to store the whole database. It doesn't synchronize the whole database. It doesn't have to keep up with the whole database, right? But what it does need is it needs when it goes when it goes over to storage to remember this is part of my working set. So we have two level caching. The first level of cache are the raw segments out of storage which are actually you know, a binary format that's been compressed and very efficient, you know, thousands and thousands of datums per segment. Uh, and we keep that in an on or off heap cache. And then the higher tier is the actual object, you know, Java objects on the heap, which is what you need when you finally want to evaluate them. 
Uh, from an implementation standpoint, again, we said we're going to use Hornet queue for the transactions. We use that. We use Google Guava collection and, well, Google Guava caches to do the caching stuff. Um, we found it to be okay, but has some overheads we'd like to get rid of. Um, obviously, we use the Java APIs for storage. Then the other thing we present to application programmers, a different way of looking at the datums is as entities. And entities feel like maps. So you can say of the database, you know, get me Fred. And uh, what ends up happening is you get back something that looks like a map. You can ask for its keys. You can, you know, do get and uh, keyword look up on it. Um, but it is effectively a multi-map because when you when you look at Datomic, because we have multi-valued attributes, you, know, you can say I like pizza and I like ice cream and I like whatever. Um, all the like attribute is multi-valued. Um, the maps that result from this are also what are called multi-maps. One key can map to more than one value. When when it is a multi-valued key, the value you get back. Um, uh, you can consider like a set of, of, of values. Um, so that's kind of an interesting, an interesting thing. It's very useful. It makes it extremely easy to use from Clojure, but also gives map-like uh, interactions to Java. Uh, one of the neat things that we have, though, is the reverse attributes. So we talked about there being this inverse index, so we can point backwards. Uh, and that you can't do with Clojure maps, obviously, because you know, the map knows what its things are. But because this is actually a set, Underneath it, uh, we can go backwards. Uh, so, what are the consistency and scale characteristics of this? Well, obviously, the process goes through the transactor, right? So, that has a very traditional model of scaling. Um, fortunately, when you take a transactor and you remove all the concurrency stuff and all of the uh, need to service reads and queries, um, you can accomplish a huge amount of work with one box. And that is the scope of the kinds of systems for which Datomic would be suitable. Um, if you need arbitrary read, uh, write scaling, it's not the right system. But people that are choosing this are choosing it because they want um, ACID, and they want transactions, and they want queries, and all the other things that they would otherwise have to give up if they did that. And you, you would uh, make that highly available in a traditional manner with a standby machine, uh, which we support. Um, and then the immutability is really the key to these this consistent reads, right? By by using storage immutably, you know you can cache relentlessly. That whole notion of you know, could you have a CDN for a database? You could actually use a CDN for Datomic. It would completely totally work. You could use HTTP caching for Datomic segments because they never get changed, um, and because you have a basis for deciding whether or not um, that is the latest. And those are the problems it sort of solves. Um, and then if you want to scale reads. You can, you know, obviously have more peers. You get more query, and you can stick scale reads depending on the storage that you choose. So, so storage like DynamoDB really it has a knob. Unfortunately, when you turn it, it costs more money, but it's still really cool to have a knob. Uh, and then that's what you want. And the query scales with the peers. Um, the testing story is is really interesting. Um, probably a whole independent talk, which Stu would do at some point, because. Uh, uh, He's in charge here, but um, just you know, so you know, test generative was born in, in inside Datomic. It's, it's what we use. Um, I, I found one of the most interesting things about the prior talk was uh, talking about the value of tests in terms of information theory, right? So if you write a test, you know it will always work. How much information is being generated by that test succeeding? None. Right? That's a really really important point. It doesn't take away from the value of that test as a regression. Barricade, um, but generative testing is really good for figuring out if you got it right in the first place, um, and because it is it is generative. And you missed the talk, and it was awesome. I was um, comfortably asleep, I'm sure. Uh, no, it was just the, it was great, really great. So we do that, and we do a lot of functional testing. We do not do a lot of the unit testing, where you say this should obviously do this. And I hope it does it forever. Um, and then at the higher level, we do simulation-based testing, which is again really interesting. Um, but I want to summarize and have some time for questions. So uh, the last couple of slides. The first thing uh, I'd like to just talk about is the fact that being a simple system and using Clojure the way we have uh, was a definite source of agility. Uh, I don't think this, these two things get connected enough, but it was another critical thing that was in the last talk. Right? He talked about margin, right? and can you, if you increase your capacity, you can deal with more variability. Right? But then he said, don't stop there. In the very next slide, 
The very next slide was an argument for simplicity in software. It was a big involved slide, but the point of it was your degree of architectural independence is going to dramatically improve your ability to deal with variability, which is what we consider agility to be. Can you do something when things change without redoing them, without rework? If you can ever get his slide deck, the slide after the leverage slide, where we talked about capacity, he said the other thing to mitigate variability in your process is isolation of components, architectural isolation of components. This is the simplicity argument I've been making. The two things are connected. I was so happy to see that. I, w I wish he had said the word simple somewhere. Um, <laughs> so how do we get agility, right? One of the things is that the, these subsystems are defined in terms of protocols, and the protocols are really, really small, like seven Entry points is the biggest protocol. The protocol for storage is three functions. Three functions. So um, we support a whole bunch of back-end things, right? We support memory. We support SQL embedded. We support you know, Postgres and, and SQL Server and stuff like that. We support Infin InfiniSpan and Dynamo, and we can probably add others, right? We did not know about DynamoDB. We, did not, we were not on the beta. We did not know anything about it. It came out in January or whatever. Two weeks after it came out, we had taken out my own homemade version of Dynamo and swapped in Dynamo and changed our business model uh, <laughs> in two weeks. I mean, it, it, it's huge architectural change to the system. We were running our own clusters and everything like that just vanished. Right? Very straightforward. Um, two weeks that took. Supporting something like Postgres or InfiniSpan was a one-day job. One day you got a new, new back end. So I think there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of power in that. In terms of leveraging closure, all the traditional leverage points that you see you know, in LISPs and now more specifically in closure, right? Did we use print read on closure data relentlessly because it's a cheap way to get uh, uh, serialization? Absolutely. It's awesome. It's brilliant. It works. You don't have to think about it. Do it. You know, if, you don't, if you don't consider doing that already in your programs, just do it. It is fantastic. Um, Having an embedded language is another sort of characteristic of you know, when applications get large enough, right? you're going to need an embedded Lisp. Well, if you start with an embedded Lisp, you're ready to go. Uh, runtime compilation was just there. right? When you have closure, you have a runtime compiler. If you want to have a language that compiles that runtime, you just sit on my back. It's there. Right? I'll, I'll carry you. Uh, extending standard interfaces of pro and, and protocols of closure. Another big leverage point, you don't have to go all off on your own. Right? When you start writing your own stuff, you should always think about, can I extend one of the standard interfaces or protocols? Because then I can just plug into all the other algorithmic stuff that's sitting around. You should always try to do that. Always seek opportunities to do that. And of course, using things like def record automatically make you play in a whole bunch of things. But when you're doing something more specific, you should order, always consider that. Oh, I'm doing a vector-like thing. Should you support nth? Should you support indexed? You should. If you do, you're going to get some benefits out of doing that. Um, obviously, we used interop um, you know, extensively, and that paid off for us. And you can see how we extended the state model. So in summary, I think Clojure was made for this kind of app. It's not surprising. Um, but you know, Clojure wasn't made with this app in mind. But this category of application, um, it needs to be very fast. Uh, it's, it's a large system, but no part of it is large. Um, there is a ton of concurrency, if that wasn't evident. There's a ton of concurrency. We never, we never, ever, right, Stu, we never sweat about concurrency. Never. We, it's never one of our problems. Uh, because we just, it's, everything's immutable, and when we need some, some uh, coordination, we use one of the constructs, you know, like Adams, uh, to make that straightforward. We definitely leverage certain interop things. As a negative thing, I would say embedding closure as a library is still not great. Um, the startup time that we sort of amortize on the server, um, we now have to pass on to our customers who are going to consume the peer library. Of course, most of their consuming applications are themselves servers, but it's still something I'd like to improve. Um, but the net result, I think, of implementing Datomic in Clojure and following the Clojure principles in the implementation of Datomic is the resulting application uh, was simple. And I think the same benefits are available to any application of a similar size. Uh, written in this way. And uh, any questions? If we have time.
Yes. Source code available? No. <laughs> Not at the present time. Uh, would it, is the kind of thing that uh, you know, third party developers could add new backends, or would you guys need to do that? Uh, right now, we need to do that. Um, and it, it's mostly just because uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I would consider that part baked yet. As I add more backends, I refine how that looks. And so publishing it would be sort of pouring concrete on it. It might be premature. Um, but certainly anybody who wants a backend supported should talk to us. We're very interested in doing it. And obviously, we've already spoken about uh, Couchbase. Mm -hmm. I think it's logical. Yeah. You mentioned that the core protocols are all small. Can you give us one example? Could you give us another example of one of the, the protocols? So the protocol above storage is the cluster protocol, which is the more, more involved one. When, we, when, when you talk about, I talked earlier about that state model, the closure state model having um, values and refs and pods. Um, that protocol is defined in terms of the storage protocol, but it is a wider protocol that has seven entry points. That is the biggest one. That's the big, that's the big kahuna, the cluster protocol, which has, I mean, actually, it could be divided into two separate ones, and then each one would be three and four. Uh, but that, that's as big as that gets. Um, other critical. And were these sort of your, your first cut, or did you evolve your way toward narrower and narrower protocols? Um, so I did the cluster protocol first. So I worked on the state model very, very hard. In fact, the state model was built so that it would comply with HTTP semantics, even though we weren't necessarily going to implement it that way. But I, I tried to make that work, and that's what, how I ended up with that seven entry point thing. And then we implemented a Dynamo cluster, and it was our only intended storage engine. Um, so it was an implementation of that protocol. But even though we only had one, there was a protocol for it. Um, and then uh, the Dynamo thing came up, and I was like, oh boy, I'm glad I put this behind a protocol. <laughs> Uh, and we swapped Dynamo in, but at the point of time I was doing Dynamo, I realized um, I needed less of it than this first protocol did. So it was a refactoring job to create that storage protocol. Um, it didn't change this one, but it put another layer in. And then that one is the one that's really trivial to make, cop to make uh, implementations of. So that would be one example of sort of the evolution. In terms of changing stuff, I spend a lot more time before I start so I don't, because I don't really like hashing around on it. Um, as Stu knows, he's always waiting for me to get off the hammock and put some code in. Uh, it's a funny story with cluster, right? Because when we when we only had the distributed storage system, I, I was griping about testing, and I, I think I set him off because I said you know mock or stub or something like that, and his you know his hair stood on end. And he came back the, the next day, and he, <clears throat> this is a great example of, of uh, closure protocols. He had taken the cluster protocol and extended it back to concurrent hash map in Java, which gave you a conformant implementation of the entire stack that ran in memory, right? Which is how, which is how I do a lot of the, the small localized testing, right? Because you, you don't ever have to you know, mock or stub for performance reasons with this thing, because you can use the, the whole stack thing that's just backed by in-memory collections. And that was a trivial job to do with closure protocols. It would have been potentially quite tricky with uh, a different implementation. Right, and so there are protocols around the protocols or interfaces around the datums, around the peer, what appears to the peer to be a peer. So we can swap peers out that actually don't have any of the same infrastructure behind them at all, but satisfy the same, um, same communications. Um, I think it's critically important. You should always put a protocol or an interface between any two things in your system, if nothing else. Um, and if you do data-driven programming, you can also then put a queue in or put a wire in between two things. If, and those two architectural guidelines will solve like 90% of your problems. Is there a sample somewhere with like a custom order system or the Java pet store or something like that? Uh, you know, we just saw the, the benchmarking thing yesterday with the Yahoo whatever, and we intend to implement that so we can show some comparable things. But we haven't done Java pet store or anything, though. There's a small, um, small example on the website that, that uses the Seattle it's just an introductory. Yeah, but it's not. It's not. It's, it's not a point. It's not a point of comparison with something else, though. Yeah, no. Yes. There's something called two-dimensional time, where you both have technical time and business time. Yes. It changes to it. Is it implemented, or do you plan to do something like? That? We 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 don't yet now. Um, the so the time that's on the transaction is uh, what what were your two terms? You could say there's a transactional time. Yeah. So it's. Technical time, right? So, so the time, right? 
So the time on transactions is technical time, but the thing is transactions are first class. So you can make assertions of transactions. So if you want to assert an attribute of a transaction, which is its business time, you can do that. But the granularity you have for that is the transaction level, not the datum level. Otherwise, datums become enormous. Um, but so that's the business time to your to a data. Well, that, what I'm saying is if you add the business time, it, it, depending on what you need to attach business time to, if the transaction is, is coordinated with that, you make an attribute of the transaction, it's very efficient. You could have added a thousand things in the transaction. You can get from those facts to the transaction and then to the business time very efficiently. Or any other fact about the transaction, the business time, business user, business process, you know, business approval, put them on the transaction. So it wouldn't be hard, I'm oh, sorry. Do you know some, uh, the transaction, does it has natural limitations? Let's say if you do pipelining on 20 cores, do you have numbers uh, to show us that this is not the bottleneck? It is the bottleneck. <laughs> it is the bottleneck, so no. why is it not a problem? Because n nothing is infinite, that's why it's not a problem. Right? If you need arbitrary right scaling, this is not the system for you. If you're like 99% of the businesses that could not saturate one box with the amount of novelty in your system, this was a good fit. It's that simple. But trying to make a universal system that can handle infinite it means dropping a whole bunch of value. And the point of Datomic is, I'm tired of seeing that value dropped. I want that value. I know many, many, many businesses that want to leverage that value. And giving it up is a bad idea for those businesses. It's a bad choice. Saying, I want to possibly maybe one day support infinity is a bad choice for most businesses.